Hello everyone, thanks for coming and joining us tonight at the um, Hamilton Python user group um, meetup, uh, once again an online one because we are still in the red here, but um, nonetheless we have once again an exciting speaker lined up. This time it's Ethan, he's been here I think was well, last year um, as well um, about this, um, about another Python project that he was working on. And tonight he's going to talk about combating spam and online forums. And um, for the last 18 months, he's been dealing with that. And he's been basically developing a package around this whole idea of uh, how to deal with that problem. And it would be also interesting to see actually with Russia now being blocked off the internet, whether that has actually changed a lot, whether the, all the spam has reduced massively in um, amount that's coming through. I mean, people um, on Twitter and whatnot, um, certain people that are usually sort of like in Russian cahoots, um, they're no longer getting retweets all of a sudden. Previously, they had tens of thousands. But anyway, um, without much further ado, I'll hand over to Ethan and I'll shut up now. Thank you. I'll start with the age old question Can everyone hear me? I just want to make sure that yep. you hear me before we dive in too far. And yeah, it's quite an interesting question with regard to the Russian situation. Um, at least in sort of the niche that my talk's going to be about, it hasn't affected us too much. But I know if we're going to take an example, uh, the React framework, they've had a lot of issues with spam on their GitHub um, with a lot of you know, malicious actors making issues saying, you know, like go Russia and all of that sort of propaganda. So it is, it is quite a big issue um, sort of online as if you promote your stance, all those sort of Russian actors, uh, if you have enough popularity and they think they're going to get seen doing it, are going out of their way to go ahead and spam those platforms. But anyway, on to my actual topic, uh, rather than getting off topic right at the start before I even said any content. Um, so yeah, my name's Ethan. Uh, I'm studying at the University of Waikato. I've been to the user group a couple of times, presented once last year, and currently sort of studying towards computer science and hoping to go into a master's of cybersecurity, which is going to start up next year. But anyway, I've got a little agenda for everybody here. Uh, so we're going to sort of start off with, you know, the introduction, sort of the who am I, what is this package that I've been working on that Peter's been discussing, and sort of what niche does it fill, where does it fit into the market, or that kind of thing. Then we'll dive on to the nice juicy bits about sort of how do we actually classify spam, because spam is a very generic word, it applies to a lot of things. And then where would you actually use this package? Why would you use my solution for your problem? Uh, and then I've got a little short break in there just because it's sort of an online thing. I want to get up, just stretch my legs for a couple of minutes, grab a glass of water, um, as well as sort of just answer any questions uh, because I want to make sure that everyone's sort of keeping up with what I'm presenting because the second part after that break, we're going to be going less of what I've been developing and more of what I've sort of learnt with regard to things like technical debt and projects and sort of ways to manage those. Uh, building data agnostic systems, which is probably my favorite topic in this chat uh, and in this sort of presentation, is the idea of a data agnostic system, which I'll cover it a bit later on. I don't want to get into depth too much right now. And then some of the more boring bits, but equally as important. So that's things like good documentation as well as automated testing of your code. But anyway, without further ado there, so I introduced myself a little bit back on the homepage, but you know, I've been studying for about three years, and, and as Peter was saying, I've been working on this for about 18 months. So that's about late 2020, sort of when I started looking into this problem and saying, hey, you know, there's a problem here. I've got a problem. How do I fix it? And then working towards creating this package, which is sort of just a... It's a Python package, firstly. This is a Python uh, user group, after all. And it's just sort of a more of a framework which gives you all the tools you need to combat spam in online forums. So it's specifically built for a platform called Discord. 
uh, sort of think web IRC sort of just real time chat platform like Skype or Big Blue Button, for example, but it's more text focused rather than voice focused. And spam is quite a big issue on the platform because the platform itself doesn't provide uh, sort of moderation tools outside of some very generic, you know, please verify your phone number or here's an email or here's a capacitor to click sort of things that are, you know, it's been solved is essentially the way I'll say that is that those protections aren't enough anymore. Sort of if a bad actor is committed enough, they can normally get around capatches. There are capacitor patches services out there, which will solve them for you uh, and things along those lines. But anyway, my favorite part about this is, so how do we actually classify spam? Because I'm sure in all of your minds, when I say the word spam, you know, certain things pop to mind, uh, possibly your emails, for example. I am sure that in each of your mailboxes right now, there is probably at least one spam email. And we know as humans who have been, at least in my case, you know, using the English language for 19 years now, that it's quite easy for us to differentiate between something which isn't spam in our eyes or things that are. But how do we turn what is inherently a, Python, a, a, a person's classification into something that Python will understand? Now, we could do things like, you know, training some neural models on it, you know, maybe some neural networks or classification algorithms. But at the end of the day, we're going to get really specific. And because our messages uh, sort of refer to things which are unwanted and unsolicited, and jumping back on sort of Russia for the moment, are quite unsolicited and come from malicious actors who are looking to promote their own cause, they follow quite a regular pattern. So the way we classify spam within the framework, at least, is rather than attempt to train a neural network or attempt to make some form of classification algorithm, we dumb it down quite a lot to simply looking at the content of the strings. So we think of every message as a string which has a unique identifier somewhere in some form. And then I'm not sure if you guys have heard of this before, but there is a concept known as Lebesian distance and that is essentially the minimum number of single character edits that it takes to get from string A to string B. And so we resolve around the idea of some form of tokenized based ratio between two strings, and I'll touch on that in a couple of slides time with a couple of examples. But that essentially involves tokenizing the string, and then we just use that algorithm to compute how many edits it would take pretty much and then turn that into a ratio from zero to a hundred where you know a hundred is exactly the same but following on from what i've been talking about with spam there is let's take a look at a couple of these examples and in your head starting with the left image would you think of that as spam so each color represents a unique person and at least in our eyes or in my eyes as a user of this community, we don't really think of that too much as spam. Sure, the messages are similar, but they come from unique people. Now, that is quite a unique view um, because one of the key parts of building out a framework for people to use is that the framework shouldn't be opinionated to your view of spam, but in this case and that I have my views on that left image there not being counted as spam because personally I feel that if it's different people, at least in this context, that implies that it is, uh, you know, okay, it's within a conversation. I see Peter has linked that uh, Wikipedia article on sort of the algorithm uh, in chat if anyone wanted to take a look. So thank you for that. But at the end of the day, I'm sure one of you would look at that left image and you would say, you know what, that 
that looks pretty similar to me. All of those messages are pretty the same. I would like to handle that as if it was spam. So as a person who has been building this framework, one of the key principles that it's been built on is that idea of while it gives you the tools, it lets you solve the problem how you want to solve it. The framework can be tailored to your specific community and the needs of your community. Because as I'm sure you're all aware as well, online communities and sort of online forums, even possibly this user group, within the user group, there's a lot of different, you know, states of mind, varying people, various approaches to life. So everyone's approach is going to be slightly different. And if you're providing a tool for that, it needs to be able to cater to everyone's needs. And forcing people to follow your opinions, you know, your straight and narrow, isn't the best approach, in my opinion, for sort of opening it up to other people to use. And then if we jump over to the image on the right there, that's something that I would, you know, more classes spam. They're the same messages from the same person. So for me, at least, that's what I'd count as spam. You know, it's repeated messages within a short time period. Because that's another key part as well is we can be handling spam, we can define spam, but we also need to take away the spam element and actually look at time periods. Because let's say, for example, we used all of my messages from the past week, that's going to add up quite quickly. Because while I haven't intentionally spammed, you know, the more messages you include, or the bigger the time period, the higher probability that you're going to have said something similar, you know, I might have said hi to you today, Peter, and I said hi yesterday. So if we include the whole day's worth of messages, then you're going to get some quite high false positives from messages, which are quite frankly, in different conversations and not relevant to the current data that we've just taken in. So Currently, what we're working off here in the images is we have a time period of about 30 seconds because it's also spam. And our definition of spam is, you know, it's quite quick. It's quite, you know, on topic and it's happening then and there. So we default to about 30 seconds. And from a technical point of view, that also reduces sort of the load on our servers and overall computation because there's less data that you have to process and check against. And now you might have noticed on the bottom left hand image, there's an image and I've been deliberately leaving that to last because we also need to handle image spam. Uh, stop words. Sorry, I'm not quite too sure what you mean by that. Um, what I was thinking of is that um... There are certain words which are fairly innocuous. Hi being a good example of that. Um, and yes, thank you, Peter. I was going to say, if, if you look at the word the, uh, it probably is in every single message that you've sent today. Um, so I was wondering about using stop words and saying these are exceptions to the idea that there's a high degree of repetition going on. Yeah, so that's quite a good way to look at it um, as well. If we were going to go down the line of sort of tokenizing it and tailoring it to the English language. Um, but a point I'll jump onto it now is that as I want to provide this framework for sort of everyone to use, um, while all my examples uh, and everything I'm showing you is going to be in English, uh, you know, it can still work um on other languages because the platform that it's built around you know there are no language requirements to a chat some text chat um so stop words uh if i'm understanding correctly could be quite a way to sort of ignore things but that relies on a couple of assumptions which don't quite hold true in the environment in the real world because uh, we've also got the English part, which I was talking about before, where those words rely on the assumption that all text sent is valid English. Um, but as we can see sort of on the image on the left, so those none of those messages are from me. I kind of just grabbed them from one of the chats. There's the issue there where um, while we as humans 
can make the connection between those words and how they're accurately spelled, or say in the dictionary, uh, a program is going to struggle to extract those, especially in a quick amount of time. Because as it's a real time chat platform, you also need to be responding in real time. It's all good if your algorithm can process something with 100% accuracy. But if it's taking five minutes, 10 minutes to do that process, and then you times that by every message, it sort of loses that accuracy because it's already got past the point and they've likely moved on from the conversation. Uh, and I don't have an image of it, but the second part of that is also, what do you do on text, which isn't valid English? If it's just say, I hit my keyboard a couple of times or my cat walks across my keyboard and it's just a random string of letters. Um, so that's sort of where the tokenizing and the using stop words or specific phrases sort of breaks down because of just how variable text chats can be, especially with people online. Uh, I know in person, at least, you know, it's quite a lot easier or over email, but in a live format, such as just a live chat room, I have seen some text, which is very much just people just mashing their keyboard. Uh, and then it sort of breaks down, which is where we use this idea of Levitian distances of strings to compare two strings together. So rather than relying on uh, tokenizing words or uh, stop words or specific phrases, we can just compare the actual letter by letters in the strings. So for example, there, if we start right at the top of the image, we can see that there's the same amount of uh, Ys at the end, uh, but we changed the first letter. And so that requires uh, about a 13, sorry, 17%. Oh, Can you other guys see my, see my slides? Tony's just saying it's disconnected. Yeah, I can see your slide. You're the fuzzy buzzy. Yeah. Um, Tony's just lost my slide screen. Hmm. Pain. Um, well, I can try unshare and reshare my screen. Might kick other people out. Um, but if we pop that back up there now, hopefully it's reloaded for you. It could take a little while for other people to see. Yeah, that's a bit of a annoyance. Yeah, I'll just wait and see if he's got it back. Mm -hmm. I mean, worst case scenario is, is watching, re-watching it tomorrow once it's converted to an actual... Um, yeah, Tony's only got a fairly small screen. I wonder whether he's seeing the messages panel and the chat panel, and and, and then to the oh. right, he can't actually maybe he can't see the presentation because it's gone off your screen. Yeah, maybe that would do it. If you closed, if you can, I guess you can hear me, Tony. If you you could close your public chat, could you? And does that make Bring it that that just leaves your messages panel. We can even close close the messages panel. Yeah, either way, we're trying to figure that out. Um, I'll keep an eye on the chat to see whether or not you've found them again, but I'll just carry on uh, before we get held up too yep. much and then possibly yep. during that break in a couple of slides time, uh, we can revisit it. Yep. Uh, but anyway, back onto the slide topic. So we're using a package called Fuzzy Wuzzy, which is a pure Python implementation of Levitian distances. And it exposes that through an API, which gives a ratio between zero to 100. So rather than the exact amount of edits, it turns it into a percentage. Uh, and that gives us a very generalized output we can work against. Uh, so as we can see sort of at the top there, um, we have only changed one letter, but due to the differences 
uh, I'm assuming it's ASCII, but I'm not entirely sure. We can see that there's about a 17% change required on that really small string. And then you might be thinking, sure, this looks really great, but how does it work accuracy wise, especially sort of as it scales up? So it's quite, you get the false positives on the smaller strings because naturally when there's less content overall, it goes and it says, hey, look, there's a lot less edits required to change these strings to match one another. Whereas if you're in a more natural conversation, uh, such as if we possibly ran on the chat from this meeting, you'd be getting a lot lower numbers just because there's more content there, which lowers the overall ratio. But we handle that pretty well in conjunction with sort of our time periods uh, and some other options. So it hasn't turned into too much of an issue. And I know I touched on it being in pure Python, uh, and I was talking earlier on about speed. So you might be a bit conflicted right now, but there is an optional extra which allows you to install a version of Fuzzy Wuzzy, which is written in pure C, and that provides about a four to 10 times speed up. So it's not too much of an issue, and it doesn't sort of raise the barrier to entry because by default, you're just installing that Python version. And that means sort of as long as you know you have Python, you can use the package. But if you're at the point where you really need that performance, you can just uh, sort of change your requirements, possibly install GCC on your host system, uh, and then install that lower level C version and get those speed ups for free without having to modify your code too much. So it gives you that performance without gatekeeping anyone who doesn't have a C compiler uh, sort of out of using it. So it's really catering to, you know, both ends of the, hey, I just need something that works right down to the nitty gritty who want to control all of the options, get the speed uh, and sort of get as much as they can. And so that leads right easily into sort of, you know, where would people actually use this? You know, it's been great that I've been talking about this, but what's the actual use case? So start at the start, because we've been talking about it already, is that the idea of some automated sort of anti-spam. So where you've got someone in your chat who is coming along and decided they're going to make it their life's effort to ruin your text channels, ruin your sort of discussion that you've going on by spamming sort of links or just malicious text or sort of copy pasta. Uh, if you know what that is, it's basically just copy and pasted text that makes its way around the communities. And you just want an automated way to do that because it's unrealistic for a human to moderate every single message that gets sent, especially when you know, you're sending upwards of you know, hundreds to thousands of messages every minute. And then we jump off the back of that with some plugins for pretty much anything. And one of my personal favorite plugins is a plugin which protects you from mass mentions. So mentioning is a pretty niche uh, topic to Discord itself. But essentially, you can think of one mention as essentially getting one notification on your phone. So you can imagine that if you're getting 50 notifications a minute on your phone from Discord, it could get quite annoying quite quick. Um, or email or sort of just anywhere that you have a notification popping up. If you receive something, you can sort of just think of a mention as giving you that one notification or one email. So when people are mass mentioning you, uh, it piles up pretty quickly and it annoys everyone involved. So there's some quite easy plugins in there, which you sort of just say, hey, look, I want to register this plugin. And then it gives you that opportunity to automatically put it in there without having to have a human go through and review it. So one of the guys who unfortunately couldn't make it tonight uh, has actually kindly provided me with some of these images of how he's actually using it. So he's gone ahead and he's created this service for one of his servers and essentially how he set it up to work because those options we we're talking about earlier on is that it will check against every message sent. And then if you meet that threshold for the Levitian distance, uh, you get three opportunities. You get three messages, which are roughly about 90% similar within 10 seconds. And if you go over that, 
you will uh, start off by getting a minor warning so something like being temporarily muted, muted so you remove their ability to talk for a few minutes then we store that punishment and then in the future when we attempt to punish them again if they do it for a second time we go back and we go hey look you know this person has spammed previously so we're going to up their punishment and permanently mute them just because you know they've been abusing that privilege um, or they've been acting maliciously and we need a human to review it and then on top of that he's also used quite a few plugins and also made his own where you can go ahead and actually report someone so rather than relying on automation because we all know how accurate computers can be at times which is safe to say not the most accurate uh, you can manually go ahead and actually report someone so if the package misses it if it slips through the net you can have people reporting that person and then if they reach a certain threshold the bot will go ahead in the background reach up to the relevant people uh, and sort of just make sure that request and you know that request for moderation gets through the right people without just having it slip through the net and so those plugins are quite a good way to customize on top of the base behavior and sort of customize it to your needs so he's pretty much customized everything around this and tailored it essentially to his community and how he wants it to work and it's quite nice on the outside because it looks great for one i personally think it looks really great and they've also sort of tailored it really specifically to their community they've tailored it around how they've got their community set up with giraffes uh, and different levels of giraffes uh sort of how they're set up there it's quite it's quite a nice setup i have set it myself but also providing that information to the end user if we look at the image on the right where it lets you see how many times uh, you've been temporarily muted how many times you've been permanently muted as well as a count of your spam um, and it's just quite a nice way and it's quite nice to see how your software is actually being used in the field because at least for me personally it gives you that motivation to go ahead and say hey look that's great uh what sort of problems are you having and then it's just that software life cycle where you make the product and then it goes out it gets used you get some feedback and then you get to iterate on that feedback and make it a better experience for everyone involved but anyway uh, i'm going to go into sort of just a short break here we'll take a look uh hey tony um how's your screen coming along uh, and sort of just see if we take a quick break. Uh, I'd like to pop out and just grab some water really quickly. Uh, possibly, let's say, five minutes, Peter. Sounds good. That's good. I'll hang around for a bit. Um, are there any yeah, questions sorry. anyone would like to ask so far? I just want to make sure everyone's sort of caught up. If there's any questions, I'd love to answer them now. As well as sort of dive into some more detail about how it works, some possible examples maybe, or just anything you want to know that I haven't covered. I do have a question already, but <laughs> the software, does that actually run on your own server or do you basically upload that to the public Discord servers? Um, so it's at least the package I'm creating and sort of publishing, it's a pip installable package. Mm -hmm. um, and then the end developer, so I don't, I don't actually make the, I don't run. So Discord, you've got like, a, it's thought of as a bot and mm -hmm. that bot essentially acts like a user with some elevated permissions where they can read the messages, uh, run moderations right. and things. And so the end developer pip installs my package, um, sort of enables it, uh, sets up a couple of lines of code, uh, and then they run it on their server. Mm. Mm. Cool. I'll drag this across here for now, sort of as a pip install. So this is quite a basic example sort of here where uh, the anti-spam namespace, that's the one that relates to my software. Mm -hmm. So you pretty much just create an instance of the handler class. And then if we go down to this on message part, so the on message event uh, isn't related to my package. That's just pretty much a listener so that whenever a message is sent in a chat, uh, it calls that function. Uh, and so we go ahead and then we just run uh, the propagate method on the handler that we initialized earlier on with that message 
and it goes ahead and uh, sort of does its thing in the background. Mm, yep. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's sort of why yep. I think of it more as a framework that you integrate with your, yeah, yeah. your yep. box rather than providing the whole lot. Mm. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, the um, comparison with email is quite different. Email is usually longer text. And in, in Discord, you just have very short fragments, and it's more of a time series of short fragments yeah. compared to email, which is by itself that gets classified. So it's yeah quite different yeah. in terms of how you have to classify something as spam. Yeah, and I it's also very like domain specific. How I could relate it back to everyone, so I'm not too familiar mm. with backgrounds. So yeah, yeah, no, no, it's, it's it's quite. I mean, it's it's domain specific, sort of like how you can actually how you distinguish sort of like something as whether it's spam or not. Yeah, because as I was touching on earlier on with um, when they brought up stop words, was that given I'm providing it as a framework as well, it needs to be a very generalized approach. Mm. Like it can't just be built around, say, yeah. like English or anything, because it has to sort yeah. of just work um, yeah. on everything. Yeah, I'm not sure how Liebenstein distance works on non-Latin sort of like languages, but yeah. Um, um, so the, uh, the actual, it... we'll jump back. We'll jump back a couple of slides here to this. So the token sort. Uh, it essentially tokenizes the entire string, um, alphabetically orders them, and then it does the Lebesian comparison. So mm. I'm assuming as long as you can sort of encode that text, um, it will work fine. Yeah, that's what I mean, sort of like, it was sort of like Latin-based languages rather than um, pictogram-based or whatever, like um, yeah. um, Asian ones, Korean or Japanese ones. Um, because that would be interesting how I would do that then. Yeah. But anyway, it, it captures a few. Yeah, it should work pretty well. I haven't had any occurrences where it sort of uh, failed. Mm. The biggest mm. issues actually have been, um, so I think thinking back, I actually missed this point. I started on it and then got distracted with Tony and forgot to come back to it, is actually how you handle things like image spam or media spam because you can't exactly tokenize the pixels of an image. Mm. Um, but the way we solve that problem is because you're uploading media to Discord, uh, they're storing that file on their servers and then they're assigning it a unique URL, sort of just a media URL. Mm. Um, so the Levitian distance calculations are actually done against that URL rather than trying to compare pixels between images or something computationally expensive. Right. So you're looking whether that or a similar image occurred before? Yeah, it's quite it's quite a compromise and quite a gray area because mm. you keep uploading a new image with a new name, it gets given a new unique media mm. URL so it falls it falls apart a bit there. Right. Um, but given we want to keep it fast and sort of generic, mm -hmm. we can't process it too much. Because mm -hmm. um, current processing times are about one one thousandth of a second. Yeah, many uh, seconds. And if you end up looking into sort of, because you have to do sort of Levitian distance, but on pixels, uh, and then you sort okay, of, then. it just starts falling apart. <laughs> yeah, no, you would actually have to extract like features of the image. And then are they looking similar enough in that case? Yeah, but no, it doesn't, doesn't work with that bandwidth and that response time. So like most sort of moderation tools, it's kind of where does, where's the line in the sand? What do you want mm. to sacrifice for mm. said feature? Yeah, people might just switch to putting text on images to get around that problem then. <laughs> yeah, it's, yeah, it's quite the issue, but yeah. thankfully yes. most of sort of the malicious actors and things, uh, you know, mm. they're running thousands of accounts, um, so they don't have the bandwidth on their small yeah. five dollar server to be uploading massive media files. Yeah. They have to resort to text. Yeah, yeah. To so we're it. lucky in that regard, but also unlucky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm.
It's interesting, yeah. Yeah. This Discord supports pretty much any type of media as well, so you get things like uh, MP4, mm. MP3 as well. Mm. They're really, really intense to process. Yep. Although there is an eight megabyte limit. Um, so. But so you can you can stuff quite a bit in eight megabytes if it's an MP3 or something. Yeah. Can and be yeah. like a half hour sort of like presentation about why you should buy this particular Viagra over another one or why you should buy into this Ponzi scheme. <laughs> yeah. And then also the issue is that is because our underlying sort of data ingest system, our Discord bot, uh, is asynchronous. Yeah. Um, with most forms of processing with like Hello um, or FMMPEG and things like that, those are all very sort of CPU bound and synchronous, mm. so they block the yep. event loop. Mm. But that's a completely different problem um, to the one at hand. I'll touch on um, sort of the data ingesting a bit more in the building agnostic system section. It's quite a great section. Uh, it's probably one of my favorite bits is talking about how to deal with all the different systems and generic, generifying, if that's a word, uh, your system to work with everything else. Well, generalizing it, yeah. Generalizing, that's the one. Hmm. I'm going to assume, since Tony hasn't said anything uh, in chat, that his screen is working, which Fingers crossed. I hope is the right assumption, but otherwise um, that video will be there tomorrow. Yeah. Any other sort of burning questions at the moment? No one's brave enough. Oh. No one's brave enough. That's right. Uh, we'll crack on then, shall we? About yep. halfway through. Good. So I hope everyone's had a little bit of a break to rest from my very enthralling presentation so far. <laughs> I'll shut up now. But we'll dive, we'll dive into the more interesting bits, which is so the next sort of section uh, in the last part of the presentation is moving more away from classifying spam um, and how I've applied it within the package to sort of things I've learned uh, over the 18 months, like technical debt, uh, things like building data agnostic systems, which I'll touch on a bit later, and some other things. But anyway, planning for technical debt, because let's be honest, it does happen to everyone. So for those of you that aren't sort of familiar with it, technical debt essentially boils down to things like features which were implemented at the expense of code quality or code readability. So in my project, at least sort of 18 months, that's a lot of iteration and that's a lot of building on past features. So when those past features have been, for lack of a better word, and to uh, discuss uh, some code self review here, very poorly implemented, it turns into the situation where any development you do now, just because it works, doesn't mean it's good. So you're actually kicking yourself in the foot in the future, because whenever you need to go back to this code, you're introducing maybe not problems because the feature works, but issues where it's extremely hard to build upon the framework that you've, you've made for yourself. And, the side issue with that, especially in corporate software, is that who actually wants to go rewrite working code just so that in the future it's nicer for us to use? Because you know you're not actually adding new features. Therefore, at least personally, the motivation, uh, you know, the ability to convince your manager to devote time away from new features, it's actually quite hard to come by. We'll go for an example now, and I'll show you why you need to have that motivation. So here's some alpha code from an early release from about a year ago. Now, do you notice any issues with it? Uh, for some context, I will bring up that. So we have a guild there 
the guild object essentially just represents a community. So it's an overarching community, sort of how the Hamilton Python user group is a community. We could also think of that as a guild. Now, every guild has a unique ID, and we always know the ID. So, in theory, if I'd taken the time to think about what I was doing, rather than trying to throw some code together, we could have a look up which was 01, or instant, because we know the ID, and we could use something like a dictionary to store the ID, and then as a value, we could store the guild object itself. But if you've had a look at this code, uh, or I'm not sure if you're familiar with iterators or uh, next, but it's essentially a glorified for loop. So we loop over every single guild that we currently have stored, and we check if the guild that we're currently iterating over is the guild that we want to get. And that's by using that ID, which we know and we can guarantee to be unique. So at small scale, sort of as I was testing this and as I was building it out, I figured, hey, it works. I've never tested it on more than one guild at once. So looping over a list with one item in it is still pretty quick. But that kind of breaks down quite quickly when we end up attempting to scale. So on Discord, say, uh, one of the other bots, uh, not quite using this, but uh, it's in a different sort of niche. They're currently at about 50,000 guilds. So that's a lot of software. And for every single message, you have to loop over up to 50,000 items to find the guild object that you want before then going on and doing the actual processing. So it's quite slow. And I hope you can sort of see how that might lead to some issues there. So it's quite slow, and while the feature worked, it's some quite clear technical debt, and in my eyes, quite a good example of technical debt and sort of why you might not want to do it. So rather than taking a 01 lookup time, we've turned it into ON, where N you know, can be thousands, if not hundreds of thousands, or millions of items. Where I simply got the feature to work, it worked for me on the small scale, and that was good enough. And then I've been fighting issues like this until I got around to re-implementing them and doing it better. And there's actually another piece of technical debt in this screenshot, which you may have missed because I've been talking about the iterator part. And that's of, so we're looping over an item called self.guilds. That implies that it is sort of a collection. Technically, it's a list. If you cast your eyes down to the bottom, you'll see a assignment there, self.guilds is equal to a guild. That's quite unconventional. If I've just told you that that variable is a list, you'd think that I've just overwritten the variable when actually what this item is meant to be doing is appending it to a list. So whenever you've gone back and reread this code, it's quite unreadable code. You have to physically step through things because they're going against things that should be common sense. We've got the actual setter here where we can see if we read the code and dive into it, that that assignment is actually an append. But to anyone who has come into this project, or if I was in a, you know, in a business and I left and someone picked up my code, they would have seen the variable is equal to something. And most people would stop there. They would go, cool, I now know that self.guilds is going to be equal to this guild object, when if we dive deeper into the code, we can see that that's actually not the case. And that's a second quite clear uh, issue that we can see of how just because I implemented it and I got it to work that way, doesn't mean it was the best idea either for me to go back and look at it later on, or if I had to force that upon someone else who wanted to come in and they wanted to work on the code. So it's really raising the barrier to entry as well as the barrier to new features because you're working around all of this really sidetracked and convoluted code. So if we jump into the current implementation for reference, uh, we've got a try there. We go guild is equal to self.cache.getGuild and we're using that ID. Now the cache there is an abstraction. Um, 
over the cache implementation. I'll cover this a bit later on in a couple slides time. But essentially you can think of that as the O1 lookup that throws an exception guild not found. And that quite clearly illustrates that A, we're going to try get a guild. And then B, it's going to throw an exception guild not found if we can't find the guild. What do we do if we can't find the guild? Well, that means we're going to need to store one and we're going to cache one. We go ahead, we check the permissions. And if we don't have it, we create a new guild. And then we quite clearly go await self.cache.set underscore guild. And that really makes it quite easy in my eyes to just look at the code and understand what it's trying to achieve. Whereas the last piece of code was riddled with technical debt where the things worked, they didn't really make sense. And if I'd handed that to you, uh, say, if I'd given the code to you, Peter, and said, hey, here's a piece of code, can you add this new feature? You'd be struggling to work around it and struggling to figure out why I was doing certain things certain ways or how you could work with those to get the new feature implemented. Uh, I agree. There was definitely a disconnect with how you read code and what it's actually doing. Yeah, the new one is much better, makes more sense. Yeah, especially when we as developers, we look at our code and we look at the things that we've implemented and because you're the person that's written that code, even if you come back two months later, you go, oh, yes, I knew what I was trying to achieve here. Whereas if you've handed it off to someone else at your work, they're getting into it with no context. They don't understand how this method or this class fits into the problem as a whole. So writing clean code is really to improve both your quality of life and your temps. So I've actually got some tips for everyone from my experience. So my first step is actually not coding. If you don't fully understand your end goal, if you don't understand sort of where you want to end up, what feature you want to get at the end, don't just start coding and hope that you figure it out on the way there. Because you're going to get halfway through and suddenly your idea, your vision, you know, your requirements, uh, if you're in a team, are going to change. You've suddenly got all this code that you've already implemented. And now you have to go either A, try to get code that represents a cat to act like a dog. Or you get to go give the cat to the SPCA and you have to restart. You have to re-implement the entire thing. So... I like to know sort of my end goal. I like to know what I am working towards. And I'd recommend for you guys as well that if you're looking to code something, if you're just thinking, hey, I think this would be cool, figure out the parts that are cool. Sort of design it, design, and then more design. So it's going to sound really dumb from a computer science point of view, at least, to be talking about design and implementation details and things that we don't really think about in the day to day. We like to sit, we just like to sit down. And... But I think designing is great. I personally like to map out how I want my code or the product to look once it's complete. So I'll sit down, I'll sort of think about it. I'll go, hey, if I was the end user, once I'm done, how would I want to use this system? And then once you've got that end goal, once you've got that idea, it lets you work backwards and say, hey, Here's the parts that I need to implement to meet my goals. And then rather than getting halfway through and going, oh, um, actually, I don't want to do this at all. You get halfway through a design and then you go, oh, I need to change the way I'm looking at this. And it's 10 times easier to simply redesign something if you don't actually have to re-implement all the code as well. So you've spent maybe half an hour to an hour, you know, you put that time in designing it. But at the end of the day, if the requirements change, you don't have to rewrite thousands of lines of code because you haven't started writing that code yet. You haven't started making that mess. And then thirdly, to top off on that, is once you do start writing the code, set standards and follow those standards. Things like code standards are Python, that's P8. So, you know, variable names, uh, class names, file names, file structures, if you're following a set standard in a set environment, then especially for other developers that you're bringing into your project, it's quite easy for them to 
look at your code and they're just going to you know recognize it and it's going to make a lot more sense because it's something they're familiar with whereas if you've decided to go off you don't follow standards anywhere um exactly like you're saying there so a program you know it's written once but it's read multiple times so you want to make it as readable as possible and so by doing that i personally like to do it using PPA through the automated tool called black uh, i'm not sure if you've ever used black before but black is essentially a command line tool which uh, formats your code uh, following peep 8 and you know they implement it to their opinion you know the design philosophy is opinionated so you don't have to be so rather than having design debates with your teammates you can just go hey look for this tool, it's going to give us a set standard and we're going to follow that standard because it's the opinion we're using. And then you don't have to go back and forth on every code review, every pull request, every issue, uh, debating small semantics. So Peter's linked it in chat there. And if you've never used the tool before, it's one of the key, uh, a couple key points from tonight that I would definitely recommend looking into because it is a great tool and it's an automated way to clean up your code. And then finally, for technical debt, is understanding that it's actually inevitable. And follow that up, set aside some time for refactoring. Because at the end of the day, you know, over time, we all, we all change people. We all change as developers. We get better. We get worse. We move on to different languages. You know, we drop a project and we come back two years later. Um, so technical debt is inevitable. And you just have to accept that. So I've done that and I like to set aside some time to work on issues or at least help understand or reduce the pain points that I know I run into. So while I'm sort of coding, you know, attempting to implement new features, I'll run into some old code that I thought was great. And then I'll go, hey, look, you know, this doesn't fit in with my current design ideas. And then I'll make a note of it. And then at a later date, I can come back if it's still an issue and sort of just rework it and make it a little bit nicer. And so rather than beating myself up over stuff that I wrote a year ago, I just sort of accept that, hey, you know, I've changed as a developer. My styles have changed. The way I implement things has changed. But not beating myself up over the fact that I've changed as a person. Um, and that with that change, you know, comes change in your code as well, especially if you're working in a team environment. Uh, not to sort of rip on anyone here, but, you know, you've got... Uh, you know, your software managers in the industry have been programming for 40 years and naturally their code's going to be a lot better than me, who's going to be a fresh, you know, fresh graduate from universities. Everyone's at different levels. Everyone's at very different levels and sort of <laughs> that is a very good point uh, from Peter in the chat about how any hack will turn into a production feature. So not writing hacky code is a great way forward. And one of the examples of that was the previous slide about how I did lookups. I wrote a hacky feature, which just worked, which iterated over a list to find something. It turned into a production feature. And then it started really getting slow when I ended up profiling my code. So I had to go and devote time to fixing that issue because I didn't take the time at the start to design it out and actually think about it before I started coding. That's my four tips. If you want to take anything away from that is A, on your software, it's easier to redesign something than recode, it, recode everything. And I would go look at the link Peter has put in chat on Black. Uh, it is a great tool. I would personally recommend going as far as running it as a file watcher on every change within your IDE a great way to auto format things without having to have an opinion on them or spend all your time thinking about styling and semantics rather than actually writing code. But anyway, we'll jump into my favorite section from the speech and that's building data agnostic systems. So this is a very generalized uh, sort of section here, but it's great because at the end of the day, your way isn't everyone's way. You know, the way I classify FAM it's going to be a lot different to Peter or to Angus. So building your system in such a way that it's flexible enough to fit in anyone's environment is a great way to, A, sort of get it into the community more, get it into developers' hands, 
and have them accept it more because at the end of the day we're all humans you're going to be a lot happier if you can tailor something to your needs rather than just getting given you know it's like if we talk about cars for a minute i know you'd be a lot happier if you got to car sort of you know you got to detail it you got to pick the uh leather seats and vinyl seats you know whatever rather than me just giving you keys to a car and saying hey look here's your car you're not allowed to do anything with it all right just looking at chat there with the previous point about technical debt uh so it looks like there's a tool called sorcery which runs in the background and suggests real-time improvements so i haven't seen that personally uh but i have some similar tools and like i was talking about now uh, while I appreciate the input, I think that it's just a little bit too opinionated for me at the moment, but I'll take a look later on. Yeah, building data agnostic systems just pretty much means that it'll essentially work with any form of data because not everyone wants to use the system in the way that you use the system. So the idea being within this package and this framework is if we talk about the cache that we saw earlier on within the guild lookup is that by default, you know, I normally run an in-memory cache. So, you know, that's really quick, uh, but it uses a lot of memory, especially at scale. So we want to provide a way for the end user to implement, say, a Redis cache without having to rip out the source code and write it all themselves. So the way we do that is through something called a protocol in Python. So these are technically uh, in the typing package and they've been introduced in, in, the, in the language since 3.8. And if you're not familiar with them, you can essentially think of them as an interface. So you define the interface for, in this case, the cache, and then the end, user, the end developer, all they have to do to implement a different one is go ahead, implement the relevant methods. And it's like the old age adage in Python. If it looks like a duck uh, and walks like a duck or sounds like a duck, it's probably a duck. So we do that with protocols and interfaces is we pretty much look at it during runtime and say, Hey, look, uh, does this class, you know, does this class implement the methods of our interface? If so, it's probably what we want. And it'll, so they provide a really easy way to implement code, uh, for both me as a developer creating and working around that but also for the end developer who wants to implement, say, that Redis cache, because I can build the framework around that cache protocol without having to rely on any specific implementation. And it's pretty much just an abstraction layer, really, because you're working around the cache itself rather than working around implementation details. And that allows you to generalize it and also cater to everyone, because if they want something different, it's extremely easy for the end user to go ahead and, you know, implement the cache themselves. And then we as a framework only need to validate that they implement the interface. And then we can pretty much go, hey, look, you implement the interface, that looks good enough for me. And then another one on that is we also have our data ingest system. So I've been talking about the cache a lot because the cache is quite easy to understand uh, because you know, you've got a Mongo cache, you've got an in-memory cache, you've got Redis, but the primary protocols and sort of my reason for rewriting everything to use protocols is actually our data ingest system. So we have to get messages from Discord somehow and get them into our system. And we also need details from those messages. Uh, so, you know, you've got the message, you've got the author of the message, you've got the channel it was in, sort of where it was sent, you've got the guild or community it was sent in, and we need all of those details. And naturally with software and open source software, there's more than one way to do it. So originally, uh, you know, in our alpha releases, the package was built around, you know, one way of doing things. If you want to use the anti-spam package in Python, you also have to use discord.py. Very heavily coupled together uh, and sort of hard-coded to discord.py did things. Whereas now we've gone back to using protocols and we just implement a library protocol. And so that means we can use any Python discord wrapper 
And as long as they implement that interface, then we can go ahead and use that software. So rather than forcing people to use uh, discord.py and follow what I think is good, they can use whatever they want. And if we're going to go ahead and talk about it really quick is I think with the usage of protocols and interfaces, you could even create an interface which implements the library spec, but works on different platforms. Because at the end of the day, all you need to be able to provide is the message content, a unique identifier for the message itself, and a unique identifier for the author. So you could go here and implement that protocol for almost any service, such as Skype or probably Big Blue Button if it has an API. Plug it into the code. The code goes, hey, your interface looks like the interface, and it'll just go ahead and it'll just work. So it's a great way to provide extendability especially extendability past what you offer yourself because as a package and as a framework you exist and your software exists to be built upon by others to their, to their needs so protocols using protocols rather than hard-coded things internally allows the end user to extremely tailor it to their end environment so they can do it how they want without being forced to generalize it or get really specific with how they do it because of how you wanted to do it. And if we're talking about from purely a package point of view, it also gets your software into the hands of more people because you've got a wider audience rather than just targeting one package discord.py as we originally did. Now we target anything written in Python because all you have to do is write some Python code. And as long as that Python code and it's the interface, it's perfectly valid for usage with this. And that just means we've got a massive audience now. And we'll go on from that and we'll lead straight into some of the more boring things. So I'm not going to go into these too, de and too in depth. Uh, after I finish this presentation, this is the last slide, I'd be happy to dive into how I've done them a bit more. Um, but I didn't want to get too specific about them because there's some very generalized topics. But I've got some strong opinions on especially documentation and what documentation should look like for a package. Documentation in my eyes should exist and it should cover most cases. For example, have you guys ever used software where there's like no documentation? There's maybe one example which covers maybe 5% of the overall feature set and it's easier to almost read the source code because there's a lack of documentation and there's a lack of resources for the end developer. Personally, in my eyes, documentation needs to exist because if you see a package like that, it's almost like waving a banner above your head saying, hey, look, I made this great package. Uh, I know how to use it, but I actually don't want other people to use it because I haven't made it accessible to other people. And accessibility is a big thing, especially in our online society these days. So making good documentation that covers most cases, uh, if not all of them, is A, great, but B, those ideas should also be conveyed in a way which is easy to understand. Because as a package developer, you need to take that step back, like we were talking about earlier on, and take that step back into the eyes of someone who hasn't used your software before, who wasn't the person that wrote it and knows it inside out. You need to almost, uh, I would recommend getting a friend to look over your documentation and say, hey, look, uh, hey, friend, uh, you've never seen me doing this before. Could you spend five, 10 minutes trying to implement a Hello World program using my package? And then you follow them along on their process and you can quite easily see where they're struggling and then improve the documentation there. Because realistically, it's that first five, 10 percent of the time and interaction with your package, which is where people struggle the most and are more likely to leave. Because once people have started using your package, they're becoming more familiar with it. So they're inherently needing to go back and copy documentation or copy examples because they're understanding how your package works and how it flows. So it's getting that first sort of documentation and onboarding, which is the most important part in my eyes. And so that's sort of why if you were here during the break and I pulled up the PyPy page, you could see we had a Hello World example right in the README itself. 
So we're really trying to get the user to use our code. Because if you're using the code, then you're becoming familiar with the code. Yeah, exactly. You demonstrate the common use case because you want people to be using your code. If they're using your code, they're becoming familiar with it, and they're also growing an attachment to the features you have. But that's a little bit of psychology there where if you're getting them to use it and they're tailoring it to their needs, then they're getting attached to the product and they're saying, hey, look, you know, this is working great. I'm loving it. Whereas if they're spending the first half an hour trying to read source code and figure out how to get their program to simply run, they're not going to be loving it. They're going to be looking for alternatives. Exactly. Nothing succeeds. Nothing says this is great, better than it running and success. And that's a great way to approach it is if you've got that initial onboarding, you make that connection rather than forcing them to figure it out. You go, hey, look, here's a really simple use case. You go ahead, you use this, and then you can build upon this rather than forcing them to figure it out themselves. And then the second part there, part which may raise some resistance from everyone here, is the importance of testing and especially automated testing. I personally think that testing is a requirement. Uh, I get hi quite hypocritical on that depending on the size of the project because writing tests is boring. I like writing new features. I don't like having to go ahead and write hundreds of test cases to test those features. But alas, I think that testing is a requirement because if you don't test your code, you're really just leaving the door wide open and inviting bugs in for both right now with your new feature as well as regressions in the future. Because I'm sure we've all got the case where you've implemented a new feature in you know area C of your code and then you ship it, and someone reports that area B is broken. You didn't touch B, so you didn't see the need to test it. And because you didn't have any tests, you couldn't assert that it was working and nothing had just been broken as just a flow-on consequence of something in C that you changed. So I personally love having automated tests mainly for regression, because once you've written that test case when you've created the code, that's a test case you have forever. Sure, you might have to rewrite it if you actually change that feature, but it's a test case that's there for the future, and it's a test that if it fails, you know that, hey, my new feature has broken an old feature. And then you can go ahead and make sure that everything's working before you ship it. And that also increases the confidence you can have. When you're going out, you're releasing a new feature, you're releasing a new release, you can go and say, yes, I've released it. Here's new features, everything else is still working fine, no breaking changes, all backwards compatible. Whereas if all you do is manually test your new features, you ship it, you go, mm, here's some new features, um, you know, it should work. If it doesn't work, let us know. And it's just a lot of hiding and it doesn't really work out well, especially when you've got thousands of lines of code. But further to that is the idea that tests need to be run using some form of automation because it's all well and good if you have tests, if you don't actually use them, of writing them. So at least in my example, I have a GitHub action set up so that whenever I commit to the master branch of my repo, it will run those test cases. And that just means that if I've forgotten to run them locally, it'll hold me accountable because GitHub also emails you if they fail. It is nothing better than finishing coding for the night, hopping on your phone and going, hey, look, all your tests, you've broken the master branch for your software. But those automated tests hold you accountable. And then if we're in a team environment, it holds everyone else accountable because everyone's human. You know, people forget to run tests. People forget to test things. So having some form of automation there to hold you accountable, well, it's just an easy way to make sure that everything's working and you haven't broken the past releases of software because backwards compatibility is a big thing in our world. I mean, Internet Explorer, for example, I mean, sure, that's technically been end of life for, what, 10 years now? I'm not too sure. I was a child. Um, but it just continues going on and on. So especially in the world of JavaScript and the web, backwards compatibility is massive. Sure, you might have new features, but you need to make sure that everything that was previously in the language still works as expected because otherwise things break. 
you know, corporations resist change. I mean, we hear all the news stories of all the corporations that even after Internet Explorer discontinued or more relevant to us, Python 2, the amount of time and effort that it takes to change something when it's working is just too much for most people. And that goes back to the idea of technical debt as well. You know, people had software that was using Python 2 and, you know, Python 2's end of life. Cool. But their software was technically still working, so they resist, they were resistant to that change to Python 3. And, you know, it's just led to some really bad, you know, migrations and things. So backwards compatibility is a massive thing. And those automated tests just help to ensure that all of the pre mode and the previous releases and previous features are still working as intended. And then my final point for tonight before we dive into questions and real specific parts is that software should make sense. It should be straightforward to use. And that builds off pretty much everything I've been talking about in the last half of this presentation where software should make sense. You know, it shouldn't be convoluted. You shouldn't be assigning something to a variable and then finding out that it actually is appending to the variable. Because if your software is convoluted, uh, in my mind, don't expect it to last long. Because that also goes back to the documentation where if it's hard to use, then people are going to go look for alternatives. So the software should make sense. It should have a logical flow to it, which if you go from A to B to C, it makes sense. Because if you're going from A to E to B to F, then it's just really jumping around the gun. And in the future, that's quite a lot of technical debt, even for you, the person who made the software and understands it really well. So imagine how much the end user who's never touched it before is struggling right now. So if I want to go away from this tonight with three key points would be A, to design your software before you build it. Spend that time up front thinking about your software, thinking about how you're going to design it, how you're going to end up with the end product, and then how you're going to work with it. B, when you're actually writing your code using a tool like Black or Sorcery to follow standards and letting the tools handle the opinions. And then C is that end user's experience. So guaranteeing backwards compatibility with things like tests, as well as good documentation to make sure that it's really enjoyable for the end user. Anyway, that's pretty much all I've got in my presentation for tonight. So I'd like to thank you for listening. Uh, I won't have too much more content as questions, so feel free to head off if you want to. Otherwise, I've got about half an hour free, so I'd love to answer some questions. And given how generalized I was on a few of those points previously, if you want me to get into specifics, I'd be quite happy to show off a few ways I've approached documentation, say, or testing, uh, and just sort of go into those more depth with actual like documentation details or sort of whatever you want to hear cool first of all really big thank you ethan for that um very enlightening talk and it touches upon quite a few key points that every programmer actually comes across in their career so thank you very much Good. so yeah does anyone have questions Yeah, Andre's just jumped in, but unfortunate timing. <laughs> he hit it just right, eh? Just when you finish. <laughs> yeah. But um, I'll post the link to the video tomorrow then. Um, yeah, um, I've got one question, Ethan. Um, with these, uh, like, let's say you it's a chat session or something, and you you have got your anti spam, and it's um, you know it's, it, it finds a user that it claims to be spamming, and so it puts them on five minutes of hold or something. Um, how do you sort of stop the user from you know like they they come in under another name or or is there anything like that? Yeah, you, you... yeah so that's kind of something that you we can't deal with because Discord's become, they follow all those privacy laws where they will let you moderate an individual. You can't sort of apply it to like an IP address or anything. Um, so we struggle to sort of catch it if they make a new account, unless they continue with their old behavior. Yeah, uh, could, they, 
but they would be counted as separate. Um, I haven't found a way around that yet. Yeah, I, I've been looking at a website. I don't actually ever write anything. I just sort of follow the news on it. Um, and uh, I see every now and then a moderator. It's manually moderated, but they, the moderator, he must be monitoring IP addresses or something because he says, oh, um, last time you posted, you, you didn't use this name. And sometimes it's just a guy has made a typo. But I think every time you post, you actually have to put your um, uh, your name. Yes, yeah, so at least on Discord, which is the sort of platform I'm aimed at, um, you have to be logged in with an account. And right. every account has some unique identifier, which is a number. Um, so we associate a message with an account, but we can't sort of figure out cross-account links. Uh -huh. But I guess um, if someone, a, a bot can't go creating accounts, they, they will normally block that no. so you can't create a thousand accounts in one minute. No, it's quite a, quite a black market of, uh, they buy like blackmailed um, user tokens or like user logins from like database dumps or however they've fished their way into those credentials and then they're running it on sort of pre-existing accounts. Ah, uh, okay. That's probably the most common approach I've seen is people get fished with links through Discord or something, you know, the standard, hey, click on this link, is this you? And then it adds their sort of details to a database somewhere which some bad actor buys and then uses. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, another question I had, sort of completely different, but um, do you use templates at all in Python? Like, let's say you want to, you know, you said design, 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 but when you actually sit down to write the first line of code, do you say pull in a template that, that um, you know, I don't know I, comment at the it, top? Depends, it depends on what I'm writing. I do have some templates set up for like bots or um, websites using Django or Docker containers and things. Uh, sort of with approaches of how I normally go with it, but I don't have a just sort of generalized template for everything though. No. Yeah. Because I think that's, you know, I mean, at least the template reminds you to do things to do. Is, yeah. is... I've got like a mental checklist of, hey, any new project I need to set up uh, black, I need to set up some form of workflow for tests. Um, and then drag in my Docker templates. But other than that, I don't really have anything. Although I have started looking into cookie cutter, I believe it is, for templates, but I don't think I share enough functionality between projects to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thanks for that. Yeah. Anyway, enjoyed your presentation. Thank you very much. Yeah. Sweet. Thank you. Well, apropos the comments about testing, Sorry, it looks like your phone's just cut out. Yes, that's the one, Peter. Okay. I must have clicked twice. Sorry. Um, yeah, apropos the comments about testing, uh, post a link in the uh, chat after Peter's permission. Um, uh, one, one of the things that uh, we're, we're noticing is that uh, with uh, remote meetings and courtesy of COVID, uh, the old geographic limitations just don't apply. Um, so uh, as people were asking me earlier, I come from almost as far north as of Auckland as um, uh, Hamilton is south. So um, uh, we are able to attend meetings uh, anywhere in the world, really, um, time zone dependent. Uh, so the idea that a Hamilton meeting is limited only to people who live in the Waikato close enough to drive to the university uh, has gone by the board. Uh, anyway, there's a meeting uh, of the Auckland group, nominally Auckland, on Wednesday evening, and uh, we've called it the Alex Zach of Testing. Um, Alex is one of our members, and he is going to introduce the concepts of testing uh, for people who haven't really sat down and thought about it, or perhaps students who haven't had to think about it during their training courses. Um, and so he's starting from scratch. 
And then we have Zach coming, and, and this is another possibility given to us for, with remote meetings. Zach's coming to us from San Francisco. Um, not often happened uh, back in the old days of in-person meetings. And uh, Zach has been working on a library called Hypothesis, as in the scientific method, Hypothesis, for some years and given a few presentations. So we're very fortunate to have him come and he's going to talk about property-based testing. So that'll be, of course, uh, uh, that'll be, of course, at, at um, uh, more advanced uh, practitioners. So uh, that's Wednesday evening and uh, uh, the link is there. If you'd like to join, uh, please do. I think I'll definitely have to bookmark that. I've got some hypothesis tests in here. Um, property based tests, but I always found it quite confusing, so I might sign up for that. Um, yeah, I, I do too, so I'm looking forward to actually hearing what he has to say and, and uh, having the opportunity to ask questions, which is something that um, uh, doesn't happen when you look at tapes of uh, old PyCons or something. Yeah. Uh, that on my calendar. Mm. No, I mean, testing is definitely something that anyone who starts out with programming actually at some stage realizes that, oh, that, that late night coding session broke pretty much 90% of my code when I was just implementing 10% of other code and just doing some bits and pieces here and there. And then, yeah, that catches right. a lot of things. Far too much, far too much tests at the end of the day as well. It's great for, it's great for confidence, but definitely mm -hmm. would recommend if you're not going to the one on wednesday write the tests as you write the features don't leave it till last because writing yeah. the retrospect all at once uh, is very demotivating yeah that's just like oh write documentation after the coding is finished write documentation as you go then you don't have to worry about it. it's the same approach yeah i think especially since it's at the point where i couldn't write it all at once it's about 4,000 lines of tests, so it's not something you want mm -hmm. to write at the end, and I made that mistake nope. right at the beginning of, if I write all the features this week, I'm sure I will have the motivation next week uh, to test them. And the then, week that will never happen. Yeah, the week that is next week from now, um, actually, you know. Mm, it's always next week. Always next week. So, yeah. do, do you build your documentation into your... Um, into your code yes right. so whenever so, there's that oh, I'll, 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 if you've got about five minutes i'm quite happy to sort of go through how to self-document your code I'll actually doc strings yeah I, I figured that's the method to use yeah but if you'd like to show them as your some of your examples that'd be great the least complicated file in here oh, the complication of internal code um, yeah, so pretty much this is this is a method which we saw in the example earlier on where I've written the documentation just purely as a doc string. Um, so this is following the NumPy style. Uh, you may be familiar, stop popping up, more familiar with like Google's code style uh, or RST, standard Python. But we can write our code just as doc strings on the method, which brings a really readable code because rather than reading all of this mess here, uh, you can simply read the doc string up. You can see the parameters. You can see that this takes a message. These are the types. You can see that it returns. And then let me just go on to another monitor and pull up the documentation. Uh, drag it over here. Might take a second to load. And then we can see here that that same doc string has been extracted out into code on read the docs. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with read the docs, I hope. But pretty much we're using a tool called Sphinx um, to go ahead and extract those doc strings. Um, I'll put, possibly put some links in the chat later on. But if we put these side by side, uh, we can pretty much see that our doc string code itself is what's just been extracted out. It is now a website and an HTML page. So it's quite auto documenting. Uh, 
and then if I actually go in here, I can show you where we do that. So then all you have to do to get that documentation and that file I just showed you, uh, the entirety of this file, which is somewhat big and includes documentation from the entire class, is to quite simply use these two lines, sort of four lines at the bottom here. Um, you can write manual documentation, which is what I've done at the top here, sort of describing what the file does. And then down towards the bottom, there are these things called directives in uh, RST. So auto class, we essentially, we use a dot, a like sort of dot notation, uh, and then the tool called Sphinx will walk that path, uh, import the file in our case we're importing the anti-spam handler class. And then using these sort of properties, uh, which are denoted by indentation, we're telling it that, hey, we want to auto document this class here. We want to document the members. We want to also document the members that don't have a doc string. And I would like the init method to be documented as well. And then that'll go off, uh, it will extract all the methods, it will extract the doc strings, and it will parse out all of that information and turn it into an HTML page. And read the docs is quite nice in that they will, for free, assuming it's a public project, rebuild your documentation and update the master site, uh, which we've got here, on every commit. So we're on the latest version right now. And if I committed a change, it would automatically go off, rebuild the documentation and update the website for you for free. Ooh, nice. Looks good. Yep. Yeah, I actually used read the docs in the past and at some stage something was broken. I couldn't update anything anymore. <laughs> so I reverted to just po hosting it on my GitHub on GitHub IO. But um, I might have to go back to that, but no. That's good. And the automatic um, API documentation is very important. And with Sphinx, it's not just API documentation, but you can also have examples and everything in there, which really, really helps tying yes, everything so together. You can do pretty much anything you want. So I've got a whole page devoted to examples here as well, mm. and that gives you the ability to put code blocks and things. Uh, if we find in here in the cache, um, it also lets you do into file mappings. So for example, uh, this file here is just sort of denoting the options you have. And then if we want specific details, we can click on this link and it will automatically map it to the correct URL and take us to that page. And so all of this, this link that href was generated dynamically by Sphinx, which again is really nice. Mm. That's what you want to have in documentation. And all we had to do for that was say, hey, look, we've got a Python object. It's a class. And then give the import path uh, in dot notation. And then Sphinx hmm. will handle everything else for you. Oh, cool. didn't know about that little uh, neat little feature. Although uh, you will want to take note in terms of the auto documentation, you do need a couple of extensions for it. Yeah. Uh, so into Sphinx allows you mm. to do it with uh, other documentations which are outside of your own oh, yeah. domain. Um, so if I want to link to, for example, uh, find it, um, there we want to oh, the for packages. Yeah, so that lets you link to other packages. So I know I've got one in here where if we scroll down, um, so we've got discord.message and that link isn't actually within my domain if we pay attention mm. to the domain, but the documentation of that different package. So it's oh, really yeah. great at linking everything together because mm. Sphinx is the major documentation thing. It sort of sets the standard and because everything's the same, it's really easy to do things like this. Yeah, that's cool. And naturally it's all customizable through variables mm. as well. So it's just a Python configuration file there. 